Oh. Digging, digging the theme song. Just vibing, you know? Mm-hmm. Just kind of it. <laughs> good after, well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> this episode's pre recorded, so I'm trying to think about what time of day it is. But hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 79. Yeah, 79 mm-hmm. of Precision the Tapestry. Uh, welcome. It's great to have you all here. It's great to have my dear friend Heather with us as well. Um, and we, this is, we're kind of nerding out about this topic because it's one that we both are very passionate about, I would say, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, right, because we're so invested in fictional characters, but we also write as well. So there's going to be a lot for us to kind of unpack and talk about over the next hour about why we think fiction is important. Okay. Um, So before we get on to talking about how we've been doing and what we've been up to, I'm going to go through our show's mission statement really quickly. We live in a dynamic society where social media shapes us by creating greater opportunities for connection. It has led to a developing understanding of the adversity many marginalized communities face, the powers causing the adversity, and those who act as bystanders as atrocities take place in real time. Our goal with this show is to make connections and have challenging conversations about social topics, current events, pop culture, and art. Together, let's weave the threads of understanding with what privilege we have in order to learn, educate, and create in a world that's growing. Yay. Yay. Um, <laughs> I, just, I have to ask, who wrote the mission statement? Because it's amazing. Oh, I did. Oh, I, I, did I did, but Ari, I think Ari did help edit it a little bit. So It's amazing. You guys did a great job. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. If you would have heard the first one, I... Uh, you'll have to go back and listen to like season one or two episodes, but like mm-hmm. I would get tongue tied so badly. It was really bad. Like I'd be like many witness. Uh, 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 and it, yeah, it was not good. <laughs> grunting and everything. Included. Oh, grunting. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Heather, what have you been up to and how have you been doing? Uh, I've been doing great. Um, just, been going to the gym and I've been working a little bit on my mystery novel. I think I finally killed off the last character I'm going to kill off, which <laughs> sounds very strange. And I hope the FBI is not currently watching. I'm talking about a book, a book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> just, you know, living the dream, going to work, coming home, paying the bills, you know, standard <laughs> stuff. Good old American dream. Yeah. And yourself, darling, how you been? Oh, well, um, I've been doing well. Uh, I've actually been doing a lot of gardening lately, which is nice. Um, I've been, what else have I been doing? I've been going on a lot of walks. I've not, I'm not committed enough to go to the gym. So like my goal is to work to where you are, Heather, and eventually start going to the gym someday. The word committed is kind of apropos. Committed. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only crazy people. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. And I love them. <laughs> right. But I love it though. I mean, we do. Okay. So our house has like a finished basement, which is super nice. And we kind of have like a workout room. It, it looks like it was like an old office, but we've converted it into a workout room. My partner has used it a couple of times, but can you guess what I haven't done? <laughs> I have stood in the room. I yeah. have looked around the room, but I have not engaged in meaningful body care exercise in this room so that's okay i haven't gardened i mean i i feel so sad to say this like my beautiful you know i've got these gorgeous blue pots that are you know just glazed and just shiny and everything i haven't planted anything in them right now i think growing them is weeds i can grow weeds really well that sounds like an opportunity for us to get together and do some oh yeah, please please i need intervention <laughs> terribly um yeah really the only thing i can grow is is you know dandelions they're my favorite flower really honey you're better at that than that i like i've seen the flowers you grow like they've been very good i am the great gardening gay like (laughs) oh is that a new youtube channel name maybe (gasps) it could be oh my goodness triple g for short (laughs) gardening gay triple g you should get (laughs) teeth 
you know, triple G or got it. Just G like cubed. Oh, that would be so cool. It would be nerdy and everything. I like this might, this might come to fruition. This might happen. <laughs> um, so, but beyond, oh, yeah, right. But beyond yeah. um, gardening and thinking about working out, um, I've been also doing some writing. I've been playing some video games. Um I've been just working on some stuff here and there, trying to like dip my toes in the pool of creativity because I'm mm -hmm. getting there. I'm still kind of feeling like burnt out from like two back to back book cycles. So it's we're managing. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, my God, fiction. Let's talk about fiction. Yay. Why is fiction important for us? So um, I guess the first question that we should kind of explore is a, a kind of a general one. And like, what does fiction mean to you? And why is it so important in your life specifically? Um, For me, fiction is, it's about escapism in some ways, you know, cause there's nothing like coming home from a bad day at work or, or even if it's something worse than that, like if you're going through a terrible time in your life, something about picking up a book and paging through it or watching a movie and knowing that by the time the, the credits roll, whether, whether the story ended good, bad, bittersweet, somewhere in the middle, um, at least for that little bit of time, you were able to escape those pressures that we deal with every single day of our lives. I mean, and I think that we would all kind of go a little crazy if we didn't have a, a way to escape. Um, I also think fiction too, in a way can teach us lessons that, you know, life teaches us the hard knocks, but sometimes the softer messages that come through fiction, they're much more empowering. I think um, to know that, you know, whether it's a story about, you know, you find the love of your life or you deal with tragedy, you just know you can close that book and you can take the lessons that you learned and walk away and be a better person for it. So that's, Ooh, that's, I, really, I really like that. There's like a realm of safety to it. Too, exactly. Right? Exactly. Because we acknowledge that, yeah, like what we're being exposed to media wise isn't real, you know, exactly. not, that I, not that I haven't had moments where I've been kind of like blurring the line between reality and being like, I wish this was real, you know? <laughs> um, but like to answer that question myself, like for me, fiction, I, I will agree and say that it's for me been about escapism, but I think it's always been about, seeing myself as a different person it's this is kind mm -hmm. of this is kind of sad um but when I was a kid because I was so dissatisfied with who I was fiction was kind of like my conduit for imagining myself as a completely different person mm -hmm. um like for example uh like I would like because I was bullied all the time at school because I was kind of othered constantly like I would just instead of like playing outside I would just like sit on a chair and just imagine myself in different scenarios where I wasn't mm -hmm. the ostracized loser you know oh, and like funny. I would gain so much fulfillment out of just imagining that I was in a, a, a different person you know mm -hmm. um I realized as I grew older that I, that that was like extremely sad and that, you know, like my place in the world mattered and what these people were saying wasn't true, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that like fiction became that outlet where I could kind of like envision myself in a different way yeah. and kind of open up my world of possibilities as well. <clears throat> that transitioned into me developing a love of writing fan fiction. Sometimes I would throw myself into the fanfics as being like a Mary Sue character. <laughs> um, annoyingly so. But uh, like it just, it was fun. Like if, if I felt like a trash monster in real life, I could be like a superhero in a piece of fiction and be cool and accepted, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Now, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, so sorry. Um, I, I completely agree with that. Um, cause I used it the same way, um, growing up it was pretty rough. So I, I, for me, 
there's a line in um, a movie. It was called The Never Ending Story. I watched it when I was a little girl. Oh, oh. I love the story. oh yay. Okay. Yay. Heart for Never Ending Story. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, there is a line at the very beginning where Bastion, the, the little boy main character, um, he goes into a bookstore and he talks to the bookshop owner and the bookshop owner asks the little boy, have you ever been, you know, Captain Nemo, you know, in the Nautilus while the giant squid is attacking? Have you ever been Tarzan swinging through the trees? And of course, the little boy says yes. And and that has always kind of stuck with me because that's true for me as well. Like when I read a story, I become Sherlock Holmes. I become, you know, Nancy Drew. I become that character, whoever it is. Um, so for me... I think that's probably why fantasy, especially, although as I've gotten older, mystery is, you know, kind of taken over for me. But like I read like the Narnia series when I was in fourth grade, I think, fourth or fifth mm -hmm. grade. I can't remember. We had to read it in class for an assignment. And I mean, the Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, Witch in the Wardrobe, I became Lucy and I loved it. I loved that I could escape to this land where all of these extremely diverse characters got along and all battled for a common cause. And, you know, spoiler alert, when, you know, at the end of the story, when the kids triumph and they got to be kings and queens, I would imagine, you know, that I got to be one too. You know, once a king or queen of Narnia, always a king or queen of Narnia. So, yeah, I, I totally understand where you're going with that. Yeah, that's that's really powerful. And I and I have no doubt that there are many who might be able to relate with us on that too, mm -hmm. right? Um because again, like like fiction is an escape, but it's also kind of like that coping mechanism that we need, especially mm -hmm. if we are if we are experiencing trauma or something like that. Oh, yeah. And and Absolutely. like sometimes fiction can be like that last final thing that keeps us holding on, you know, when, when we need it most, which it's Absolutely. super, it's super interesting. Um, I would also say that uh, fiction is important in my life because I think that it's allowed me to kind of understand the nature of storytelling a little bit in the mm -hmm. sense that like, obviously like, if I'm sharing my life experiences, like those are real and everything like that. So that kind of changes the playing field a little bit, but there is a way to like present like your experiences in a way that, that helps other people understand where you're coming from, I think. And I think looking at the way fiction presents stories, we can kind of like model that for ourselves too. Mm -hmm. When we are kind of sharing our own experiences. So I would say that that's another reason why, as I've grown older, fiction has been beneficial for me because it's allowed me to understand that nature of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to talk to talk about one of my favorite articles ever. Um, so there is an article titled Why Fiction is Good for You by Jonathan Gottschall. I was uh, introduced to this article do, during my grad program when I was like a uh, student teaching because it was an article that we would use in our composition classes to have students talk about like the nature of fiction. And, um, and essentially the article is about, well, obviously, duh, why fiction is good for us. <laughs> um, but it, like the, the quote that really stands out to me is, and, and Gatchel says, uh, but fiction is doing something that all political factions should be able to get behind beyond the local battles of the culture wars virtually all storytelling regardless of genre increases society's fund of empathy and reinforces an ethic of decency that is deeper than politics powerful yeah like it's it's when I, like when I read that for the first time, it kind of was like a validation of all the things that I've loved over the course of my life, fiction wise, mm -hmm. because I don't know about you, but for my entire life, I have had people always kind of crapping on the fact that I like certain fiction, like, like Donnie, you like Godzilla, really? Or Donnie, you're a Trekkie, like 
are you five or are you a nerd or down hell yeah. Yeah, the answer is hell oh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, Donnie, I'm a nerd. why are you so obsessed with the lord of the rings like it's so boring blah 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 and in my mind i'm gonna be like well you're 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 boring so shut up i'm sorry <laughs> anybody who thinks in the hobbit smog attacking the town of dale is boring really uh, right right mm -hmm. i'm just like so you think that good storytelling and character development are boring okay well that speaks very loudly very two-dimensional perceptions on <laughs> on entertainment i guess i'm petty though so <laughs> but like honestly when i read that quote like like i mentioned it really validated me because like, I remember one, like, one of the earliest feelings I felt of being othered was the fact that everybody thought that my likes were dumb and didn't want to connect with me on any of them. Yet everybody would expect everyone to connect with them on their likes, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, it kind of, like, reading that as an adult, I was like, wow, like, I still have, I still have baggage. Like, I, I still get insecure about, like, people making light of things that I like, even though like sometimes I will joke about like, yeah, I like a, a giant dinosaur that's a man in a suit destroying cardboard boxes, basically. Well, it's more than cardboard boxes, but you know, right. I digress. Uh, <laughs> how about for you? Like, like, were you ever like othered or invalidated for the things that you like as a kid, like fiction wise? To be honest, not really. And the reason why is growing up um, as a heavier woman, you know, now, now I look at it like, you know, I should, never should have done this. But, you know, when you were the fat kid, you had to be a chameleon. You really did. Um, you, I didn't really express much about the things that I like, except for a very close knit group of people. So, um, the only way I would say I was othered had nothing to do with fiction and everything to do with the way I looked. All right. That's my appearance mm -hmm. was the thing that people always went to, but, and you kind of expect the short little fat girl with the glasses to be a book nerd. You, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, it's kind of like you open up the dictionary under bookworm and there's my picture, you know, or somebody that looks like me. So no, I didn't really get othered for that. Um, but I will say this, I did kind of get othered for things that I didn't watch or read. Mm. Like, okay, so we're going to, we're going to go down the age Avenue here. Um, when I was a teenager, <laughs> um, yeah, let's do yeah, no comments. Anyway, um, big time, big time was 90210 shows like friends. I'm sorry if if those of you who love them, more power to you, but I, they just weren't my bag. I could not mm -hmm. get behind it, but I'm not really a soap opera kind of girl. Um, but so my my classmates would be sitting there talking about the latest love triangle on 902 and 0, and I'm sitting there going, I don't know who these people I don't know who these people are. I, just, I don't, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I knew I knew the actors names only because they name drop them so much. But I didn't, yeah, I was, I was not a big time into, even to this day, I am not really a binge watcher of TV shows like that. I just, mm -hmm. I just get behind them. So when I hear people talking about, you know, even recently in the last, you know, half a dozen years, like shows like, you know, Orange is the New Black, never saw an episode. I just, I just, it's not my thing. So right. people would look at me funny though, like. How can you not want to watch Jason Priestley on TV? And I'm thinking, <laughs> just Jason Priestley. Just kidding. No, I know who he is. But yeah, I yeah. So that that would be mine. Mine is almost a reverse otherism in that regard. Interesting. I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, but I like I'm thinking about it now, and I've also experienced that periodically too. Um, <clears throat> like, and it has a lot to do with like horror. Like, I don't mind horror. Mm -hmm. um genre but like I don't always want to watch horror but like there's yeah. been a lot of like really popular shows over the past few years that have been horror and people have been like Donnie why aren't you watching this like what's the matter with you and I'm like I, I don't know I'd rather watch you know science fiction fantasy right now like yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I'd rather watch a Marvel show before this <laughs> like let's be honest 
See, and I'm one of those weird people, like the old black and white. They they were called horror back then, you know, like Creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh my god, oh my god. I love that see, stuff. The I, thing know is, I love those things. Godzilla is considered that. The original film is considered mm -hmm. horror. As much really? as people always want to debate with me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is considered that. horror because it um it's like horror sci-fi kind of riding the line yeah. between the two. I guess I kind of I guess I kind of get that, you know, because it is a loose term a loose term. It's a monster. So well, I, the, I do kind of get it. Well, and the truth is, if you if we watch the original Japanese version, more of the horror elements are included. The Americanized version kind of stripped away oh. a lot of like a lot of that stuff. So uh, yay for we Americanizing things. <laughs> <laughs> I hear a movie marathon coming. I need to update my, you know, knowledge base of Godzilla. Oh, Godzilla movie marathon. <gasps> I would be more than happy to assist you with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially since you have them all. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Well, that and and I think I think they're out on streaming services now too. I'd have to look. I can't remember which ones though. Um. So. Like, again, I just, I don't know. I really get frustrated with people who do kind of get overcritical for you not watching the thing that they, they are watching. Like, like I can under, like, I know, like, for example, you and I don't watch the same stuff all the time, but we don't shame each other for not. No. Like we might say to each other, like, Hey, this might be something you may find interesting. Like if you ever want to check it out. Right. But I'm never going to be like, Heather, you're not watching the new Star Trek shows. What's the matter? Like, I'm not going to do that because that's, it's just a very rude and dismissive thing to do in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> There's a new Star Trek? No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know if I'll ever be able to. Of course, for me, it's it's a memory thing. I don't know, and we're totally going off topic from I life, which is important. But I don't know if I'll ever be able to let go of Kirk and Spock and Bones and oh, her. I, I I just don't know if I could ever let go of the originals. Mm -hmm. And not that I wouldn't, you know. How I put this. I, I'm sure the new stuff is amazing because the genre is amazing. You you can't not be amazing you know in that genre mm -hmm. but i just don't know if i could ever let well and, and the thing is like go. with with shows like star trek and other ones i'm thinking of that are like also large and expansive like star wars doctor who mm -hmm. like like there's been so much content yes since yeah. their original releases yeah that it like it would take a while like there are right now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Star Trek series. Oh Eleven, God. I think. Eleven, wow. actually. Okay, yeah. That would take a long time to get caught up on. Yeah. Now, like, mind you, I watch them at least once a year. <laughs> it's very, <laughs> very time-consuming. But um, it's possible but again, it's, it's, it's a lot. Like I'm yeah. one of those people and, and my partner gets really frustrated with me over this. I think I've told you this, but um, my partner loves binge watching. Like he mm -hmm. loves to sit and binge watch something from start to finish in one sitting. I do not mm -hmm. like to do that. I like to watch like maybe one or two episodes at a time, go do something, come back later and then yeah. continue it because it gives me something to look forward to. Yep. And it's easy for me to do that because these are shows that I'm already familiar with. Right. But like when he wants to binge watch something, he wants to binge watch something brand new. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to commit to it. I don't know, like, <laughs> like, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to like. He has commitment issues with TV shows. Got yeah, it. I do. <laughs> I do. And I'm like, I, like, and it's funny because I read somewhere that, people with anxiety and depression typically will gravitate towards specific shows and movies that are like mm -hmm. their comforts. Yeah. And of course, Star Trek is one of mine. So mm -hmm. because living in the dystopian hellscape that we're currently in, I need some glimmer of hope of humanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just a little, 
Yeah. yeah just, just a smidge. Just a, little a bit. smidge. <laughs> so what pieces of like, so we, we, I know we've got Godzilla. I know we've got Star Trek for sure, but for you, like what pieces of fiction, you know, written audio visual, like have really impacted you outside of Godzilla and Star Trek? Um, let's see. Um, I really, well, obviously the Lord of the Rings universe has really mm -hmm. impacted me. Like not just the movies, but the books as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like those books were kind of like one of the first bonding experiences my mom and I had mm -hmm. um, because my mom read those books. And I, I'll never forget like going to see those films in theaters. Like I was like a mm -hmm. teenager or something. And it was like my first significant exposure to the Lord of the Rings. And I could see that my mom was like on cloud nine. Like she was just oh. like, she was nerding giddy and i was just like i've never seen my mom like this before like maybe i should check these out and that's how it happened from there um but i i just think that the lord of the rings universe is a very good like it's very good storytelling but the characters are so dynamic and engaging and there's great themes and oh, absolutely. morals of the story that really it really hit me. Uh, other other fiction things that I like, I love. Uh, I love like witchy alternative TV shows. <laughs> I love Charmed, for example. Oh, I'll grow up watching that. Yep. I love Charmed. Me too. I also love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. They were like out at the same time, mm -hmm. so I was like, one of some of my gay awakenings were from <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Angel. Oh my God. Was he? Oh yeah. I, I had a soft spot for Spike. Oh, oh I did like Spike as well. Like I, oh, oh. yeah. And then in yeah. Charmed, Leo. Oh my God! I, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you can. You can. You no, Charmed is one that I used to watch every year as well, and I'm kind of overdue. I need to. I need to get my crap together. I've been meaning to watch the new. There's a new like Charmed series. It just got canceled though. So oh. I need to watch that. Um, other ones. Why am I blanking? Um, oh, that's all I can think of for right now. Well, and, and the problem is, is that, you know, and I'll answer the question too in just a second, but I think it's a really hard question because it depends on the time in your life. And, yes. you know, so for me, I would have to say, okay, I, I've been a lover of books my whole life. Oh, I, I mean, some of the first, I can remember, I, I mean, when I first learned to read, oh, get out of my way. I absorbed books like mm -hmm. crazy. In fact, to this day, my favorite store is still Barnes and Noble. Oh my God. When Barnes and Noble <laughs> came out and that, that became the, the place to go for books, it was like, the Mecca is calling me. <laughs> when the gates opened, the angels started singing. <laughs> the gates of escapism have opened. <laughs> so, yeah, my my husband, you know, even on our date nights, he knows that we're going to go to Barnes & Noble. He takes me to Barnes & Noble for a date. That's not I a know. bad date. That's a great date, though. Oh, I agree. I agree. And it works for us. So we'll go to dinner and we'll go to Barnes and Noble and he kind of wanders around and just stares and stuff. My husband, he likes to read, but he, he's more of a nonfiction reader. Um, he likes um, uh, like history. He loves American history. Um, he loves uh, sports, you know, books on sports and sports teams, stuff like that. Um me though, yeah, beeline to whatever I'm currently craving, whether it's the section with the ghost stories or the section with the mystery novels or the section of the fantasy, beeline. And once I once I get a taste for a kind of book, I cannot get enough. But mm -hmm. any rate, so I've already told you about the Narnia stories, but I think the earliest one that like physical book was The Secret Garden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got that book. My mom took my brother and I to the library and which was um, we didn't I don't want to make it sound we went all the time, but we went a lot because mm -hmm. my mom is an avid reader. She she did digest books as quickly as I do. So at any rate, um, she took us to the library and that was one of the books that I got, you know, Secret Garden. And I 
fell in love with it. In fact, I actually have somewhere around here um, a beautiful uh, edition of it with um, hand painted drawings and everything. It's just it's a gorgeous version of it. Um, but that that story, though, that's what I blame my love of every genre on because there's mystery in it. There is um, some fantasy in it. There's I mean, there's it's, it's kind of a kind of a good catch all. So absolutely. One of the first books. I never thought of it that way. It is kind of yeah. a hodgepodge. It is. It absolutely is. Um, and there's foreign culture in it. Uh, there's, I mean, and it, you can't help. Everybody has had their, you know, Mary, Mary, quite contrary moments that, that the character, you know, I mean, everybody's had that and everybody has known somebody like Dickon or Martha. Um, it's, or that estranged uncle, you know, it, it, we've all had people in our lives that match those kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. So for me, it would be that. And then I would say movie wise would be Labyrinth. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and, you know, now as an adult, I can I can appreciate, you know, I absolutely love David Bowie as the Goblin King. He did an amazing job. One of my um, gay awakenings, too. <laughs> David Bowie no. was a yeah, attractive. Oh, yes. Yes, he was. Yep. And very like oh. repre like very uh androgynous and stuff like that too. Oh, absolutely. Um he was I don't I don't know how to say this. David Bowie, which you could do an entire episode just on him. Um he was sexy, but but wasn't one of those people that was like, "Oh yeah, I am so sexy." You know, he just he, he was such a cool guy. He really was. But at any rate, um, I a little, you, you know this about me, but our viewers don't. I absolutely love Jim Henson and the Muppets. Love. What? Them. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. And let the shaming begin. But no, no, I love the Muppets. Like I have animal Muppet slippers that I wear at 42 years old. Okay. Love the Muppets. I have an animal ornament that one of my students from years ago when I was teaching gave me, and I still put it on my Christmas tree every single year. It is one of my favorite ornaments. So it was, it made sense for me to absolutely love Jim Henson's, you know, labyrinth. I also love the dark crystal. But once again, if you think about those stories, it's a little bit of everything. It's mm -hmm. a little bit of danger, a little bit of adventure, a little bit of mystery, a little bit of, I mean, so very early on, I, I kind of fell in love with multiple genres. So, and then of course I had my stint with the babysitter's club. You know, there was that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but yeah, I just, there's just something to be said for those kinds of stories that can take you back. Literally. I just hear the theme song of labyrinth and I am a kid again, you know, and there it's, it's just, oh, yeah. I love it. You know, I love it. And I would have loved to have been in the labyrinth and gone through it because I love puzzles. Mm -hmm. and I love mysteries. I would have loved to have tried to figure out the labyrinth. And, you know, I probably, you know, would have spent more time talking to the little worm at the beginning because I love his accent. But, you know, <laughs> I'm always so like, I admire your love of puzzles and mysteries and stuff like that. Well, like I like mysteries, but puzzles themselves. Oh, my God. They frustrate me. I get so impatient. <laughs> Oh, I love puzzles. I can't I'm like, I need to know now. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's jigsaw puzzles or word puzzles or video games of puzzles. Oh, I love, I love to sit and figure things out. See, my partner likes that too. I don't know why, like there's like a disconnect in my brain that's just like, nope, too much, too much commitment. <laughs> too much commitment. <laughs> it comes back it. to that, it comes back to that, too much commitment. <laughs> So what you're trying to tell me is if I got you a Godzilla jigsaw puzzle, you wouldn't put it together? Oh, hell. <laughs> I, okay. I, I would do that. I, like, if it were, a, I would do that. I, I would I know be obligated would. to do so because it's Godzilla, of course. Oh, of course. And if it was a Mothra jigsaw um, puzzle. Sign me up. But I could see you putting it together, gluing it together, and framing it. Which some people I, do that. I would do that. I know you I would. Need, I need more Mothra art on my wall. You can never have enough moth or art on your walls. Uh, I'm running out of wall space in my office. <laughs> oh, that's when you start taking over the living room. Oh, gosh. I would never hear the end of that. <laughs> we have, like, we have, like, this uh, agreement that nerdy stuff stays confined to my office space slash nerd nook. 
<laughs> and, the rest of, and, and the rest of the house is like traditional, like modern de decor. I let my let my partner deal with decorations throughout the rest of the house as long as I get this space. Okay. But, you know, I see there's a little corner over there that doesn't have anything on it. So it would be good to, yep, next to the yeah. door. There you go. The <laughs> door doesn't have anything on it. Right? I mean, oh, my God. I got the entire door to cover. I, like, I deliberately bought the, okay, so these bookshelves mm -hmm. are actually, like, fastened together because mm -hmm. like when individually they're like these small cube ones mm -hmm. so I fastened them together because I wanted like taller bookshelves with more compartments mm -hmm. so now I can have like art <laughs> I think like, that's awesome my Godzilla figures are up here and if you look up a little bit further I have like all oh my god I love it I love uh. it well, like currently right now, and those of you who have seen pictures of, you know, Donnie on his many pages, you'll recognize the chair. Um, all those pictures and everything were taken in my living room. But um, so I'm in my uh, living yeah, room because right now. like Heather has like a studio living room, like not quite, but yeah. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> um, so yeah, we do a lot of our pictures and stuff here. Um, but in a couple of shows, I'm sure I'll end up in my office, you know, when we, when we're doing live shows. So you'll get to see my four foot tall David <laughs> Bowie poster for Labyrinth, but you'll also get to see, I'll show you my office then too. In my, what, what do they call that? There. Like, instead of like a man cave, what do they call it for women? A, a diva den? Your diva <laughs> den. <laughs> diva den. Diva den. I like that. But, uh, yeah, I'll show you in my, my small collection of books i have books all over the house i was gonna say who are we kidding <laughs> okay yeah um i i have one two three four bookshelves and i still have books on other surfaces in my house i'm an addict i, I still I really have am. like i have like totes of books in our basement that i need to like go through <laughs> um because obviously I have only so much space and I can't, I don't have room in here for another bookshelf. So, Oh, we, we need, we need to start, you know, a book readers anonymous and our acronym will be bra, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, it's good when I made him snort. <laughs> that was a gross snort too. <laughs> oh, I love ooh. it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there's AA and the NRA and whatever will be BRA. <laughs> Book Readers Anonymous. I that's my favorite acronym right now. Okay, I love it. <laughs> so we have totally gone off the cliff. On oh, I know. This is what yeah. we typically do, though, on the show, anyway. So, <laughs> um, so honestly, like this kind of brings us back to talking about representation as well. And I you know like Heather and I were talking a little bit about this in the back room. And I kind of was talking about like our show's history and, and talking at length about representation, especially LGBTQ plus representation. Cause it's like obviously a group that's severely underrepresented in media. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, like, I think, what fiction allows us to do is it allows us to see ourselves in different situations, different worlds, mm -hmm. uh, coexisting and cohabitating with different people. And, and it allows us to kind of be in those shoes, but also be accepted by the people around us. Like I'm going to, for example, there's a new show called Heartstopper. This was one show that Britt made, that my partner made me binge watch. Okay. And I'm glad that I did, because it's actually a really, really good show. It's basically like a high school love story between two LGBTQ plus characters. And it's so wholesome. And, and oh my, it's, it's such a beautiful like show. I oh. cried like five times watching it because it just, it shows two LGBTQ plus people connecting and experiencing the things in high school that everyone else experiences. Oh, yeah. and, and I think that it, cause I've been kind of 
watching and listening to other people's commentary on the show and like a lot of other like lgbtq plus people like just felt super wholesome about it but they kind of felt like a little hollow as well because we kind of think about the reality that we never got to experience oh yeah makes sense any of that in high school Mm -hmm. so it's it's like that that power of fiction and being able to connect with us on that level of being able to kind of fill that void that we never had filled. Right. Yeah. So it, yeah, like it's, it's a really, really powerful show. I think I'm going to watch it again. Like I just, it like, don't get me wrong. Like a lot of those things that I didn't get to experience in high school, I've experienced since and everything like that. But Mm -hmm. at that very crucial time in life, it's so like people don't understand like how important prom is or how important yeah. um, like just having like acknowledgement from peers in a school setting is right. Yeah. Um, but then fast forward later in life, like you, you it kind of all comes back like and being like, I wish I got to experience that. I wish I got to experience that. So, but that's why uh, like, in conclusion, um, <laughs> I, I had a direction I was going in, but then I got over emotional like I always do. Um, but that is why good representation in fiction is important because it will oh, yeah. help people feel that sense of wholesomeness, mm-hmm. um, which is why I love Heartstopper. It's why I love, there's another comedy show called Shit's Creek, um, which has like, really really great representation and there's like like it's it's, interestingly Schitt's Creek is a show that has like zero drama in it Mm -hmm. um because um what we see a lot in in fiction is that LGBTQ plus characters are often reduced to like these different tropes that we see of like oh Oh, the the broken character the mentally deranged character the character that goes off the deep end and you know turns from good to evil or they die you know yeah so um like when we see shows that don't do that like it's like whoa this is different like what um again star trek discovery one of the newer star trek shows star trek for years has kind of danced around the topic of including lgbtq plus people Mm -hmm. until star trek discovery and now they have like two gay characters a non-binary character a trans character a pansexual character a character who is a lesbian like and 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 these people are just coexisting in a future going on adventures together solving things together oh yeah and it feels good being able to see that it's almost like um, shows like that. And there's actually um, a book and I have it on a shelf in my office somewhere. I read it a couple of years ago. So I'm so sorry. I cannot remember the name of it. But um, essentially what it's about is a brother and sister. And um, the sister is cisgender and the brother is. Um, okay. They don't really come out and say it, um, if he's bi or if he's trans or if he's um gay so Mm -hmm. i'll just use the term gay just in general because they don't really come right out and say but um basically what happens in the story and i'm going to kind of ruin the ending for you a little bit but (laughs) spoiler um, warning everybody spoiler warning of course (laughs) the second title of the book how much of a spoiler alert is it but anyway what it is is um this um king all right um he's like the king of like fairies and goblins what are kind of a kind of an oberon type character um he um, takes the sister and the sister uh, becomes his warrior, which is really cool because you often don't see strong female characters in these kinds of, it's always the damsel in distress thing, but mm-hmm. she becomes his, um, basically his primary knight. Uh, mm-hmm. cause that's what she fantasized about. And, um, the brother falls in love with the Oberon type character. And in the end they end up together. So it was, it was so cool Instead of it being, oh yeah, I, I'll, I'll lend it to you as soon as I can find it. <laughs> it's in there someplace. But um, it's it's a it's a really amazing story. And what I loved about it 
it wasn't a trope type character. I mean, these people felt real, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, it just, there wasn't that tropism in there, but it's, I think those kinds of stories and the stories of like the Star Trek you're talking about, it gives us hope for acceptance of all people. Right. You know, well, and the thing is like, it, it gives us that hope when we don't even expect it. Right. Yeah. Um, I will give you an example. Uh, this was like two or three years ago. It was the first season of Star Trek Discovery. And um, like they, the thing is like in Star Trek, they don't, because it's so far in the future, they don't, they're at a point in human society where they don't have to focus on like the trauma of being LGBTQ plus or mm -hmm. of coming out or anything like that. Because at that point in time, humans accept one another like wholeheartedly. There's mm -hmm. a scene where one of the main characters who's LGBTQ plus goes on, like has like a really, really, I guess almost a traumatic day at work. And there's a scene at the end of the day where him and his partner are brushing their teeth and just having like a moment of like, hey, I was really worried about you today. Are you okay? Like, don't do that again. Like, don't put yourself at risk. Like, it was, like, I, it was the end of the episode. I sat and I cried for, like, an hour. Yeah. Like, I was just like, I have wanted to see this so long. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. And seeing it just did something for me. It, it was just, like, again, filling that void. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was um, an episode, my husband and I um, are currently binge watching um, CSI, the original ones from Las Vegas. And um, we were watching an episode several weeks ago that it had a similar impact on me. I cried. Mm -hmm. Basically what it was, um, these transgendered women, they so desperately wanted to get surgery. And of course, when this, when these came out, you know, you got to remember that this surgery was not, it was kind of like done behind closed doors and, you know, by um, questionable individuals and such. Well, um, a, the punchline is, is that a transgendered woman, um, she had had a successful surgery and she was trying to help other transgender women to complete their surgeries. It, one of them, it, and it was, it was an accident. It just, it went horribly wrong uh, because I mean, she was having to do these surgeries in, um, where were they at? Oh, they were in storage lockers. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like you can rent the big storage lockers, you know, like cube smart and stuff like that. They used it as an operating room because they could rent it and they could get enough power in there to run all of the, the lights and everything. And this, this one poor woman died on the table and I watched that and I, bald because mm -hmm. it's such a horrible it, it it brought out the fact that so many people don't think about what it was like and i know there's still places in this country unfortunately and in the world where people still have to use the storage locker well but, like yeah well it, it gender affirming care like obviously when we think about like these different don't say gay bills and anti-trans bills that are being passed. Like when people don't have access to care, then they will work toward finding other ways of getting that care. And some exactly. of those methods are definitely potentially dangerous or risk taking, you know? Yeah. And I, and it sounds like that you said it was CSI. Yeah, it was a CSI episode. I don't remember the name of it because like, we've been binge watching and they all kind of blur together. But um, I, I guess and and at the risk of going, you know, not wanting to go too far down the rabbit hole with this to bring it back to fiction. I mean, I think that's something else that's horrible about fiction. You know, we talked about how you can literally walk a mile in that person's shoes. Mm -hmm. It was a very vivid realization of what what can happen, yeah. you know, when we, when unfortunately people have to use something like the storage locker to, to have those kind of procedures done. And it was just, you know, it was very eye opening. Very. Yeah, it's, it's educational, but also yeah. it creates like, and I think that's 
what I love about fiction too, like it uses its power to create commentary on mm -hmm. real things that are happening or have happened. Yep. Um, and it, and it frames it in a way for viewers to absorb it safely and take mm -hmm. something away from it. Meaningful. Me that's right. meaningful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really powerful. Oh, it was. And the fact that it was a 45 minute episode of CSI, you know, of, of all places. You, mm -hmm. I mean, you expect to see stuff like that in documentaries and things. And I think that's what's so powerful about fiction is that once again, like I said, at the start of the session, um, fiction can teach you even hard lessons and soft lessons, both in such a way that it leaves you remembering it's like, yeah, I could have watched a documentary on it. And would it have been powerful? Probably. But I almost wonder if would it have been as powerful because the TV show makes you more vested in the people's lives and what they're going through and their experiences. And, you know, though documentaries allow people to share their stories, it's not exactly the same thing. Do you understand what I'm where I'm yeah. going with that? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So let's let's kind of like focus on the fact that we both are fiction writers as well and i really want to hone in on what you do because you are a published author um when it comes to your own writing how do you hope your pieces connect with the audience I guess you could talk a little bit about your books first as context okay. and then answer that question. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so uh, those of you who don't know, um, I do have a trilogy of um, fiction. Um, it's fantasy. Um, I also am working on a mystery novel. So I guess to kind of explain for me, since the mystery novel isn't done yet, um, I don't want to give too much away on that one, but um, the main character in that one, um, she was, and I, you know, just warning, please guard your mental health. She was raped. Mm -hmm. All right. And the story, um, revolves around, um, basically trying to solve what happened to her. All right. Um, and, and going after the people that did this to her. So mm -hmm. that one, um, I think if there is, you know, what I want you to take from that is that there are both good people and bad people in the world. And I know that is, well, duh, but I think sometimes we forget with so much bad out there that there really are good people too. I think. Yeah, we forget it's, that. True. it's true. Um, for my fantasy series though, which, which is fully published, um, it's called the clandestine series. Um, the first book the, is called the faded. The second one is called the curse. And the last one is called the betrayed. Um, those, you know, for those, I, I'm really hoping that people just take away. That was a nice story. And I got away from my daily grind and I don't, don't really have so much a huge, slap you in the face moral but i guess if you if you were looking for a lesson you could definitely find it in there um it's about this main character who is ellie and ellie has um elemental powers um she gets her powers from her ancestor but what's interesting about it is her ancestor who spoiler alert is merlin merlin gave his powers when he was about to die in, in my story at least he gave his powers to certain families all right although ellie is a direct blood descendant all right mm -hmm. of him but at any rate he gave his powers to to certain families and these families you know when they had children and their children had children they all had some kind of latent ability and um for example i mean you've heard of dancers you know being lighter than air or, you know, people having a green thumb and being able to grow things. Well, if people that can can grow things, they're earth elementals, they just don't know it. Or dancers, they're, you know, air elementals and they just don't know it. So what I what I'm very proud of for this this series is that you could be an elemental. Anybody mm -hmm. can be an elemental. Um, we're all special. We all have talents. We all have gifts. And 
there is no such thing as a mediocre mundane person because we all could have. Yeah. It's, it's almost powers. as though, well, and, and my, like what I took away from the characters as well is like, like your books have this way of taking people who are othered in some way mm -hmm. and subverting that, which I think is yeah. like, I think that is probably the biggest moral that I took away. Like you might think you're othered, but you're actually more than you, than you are. And you mm -hmm. don't even realize it yet. Yeah. There's, there's something to be said for having that power. And, and my, my books also have an underlying current of the moral being about choice. We can choose to blame, you know, oh, these are the cards that I was dealt and we could wallow in that or we can choose to embrace the destiny that we have been given and live it to its full potential. Mm -hmm. it, it's about choice. And that's a lot of um, Ellie has to choose. She has to choose whether or not to curl into a ball in the corner and suck her thumb or accept because because her fate's pretty bad you know mm -hmm. um what what she has to do is is you know and you have to read the books to find out what she has to do plug plug but <laughs> uh why not <laughs> but um she had everybody has a choice you always have a choice mm -hmm. and in her case she chooses to accept the rockier path and it leads her where it leads her um yeah I love that. But I, I love that it just, it brings people together though. Oh, thanks. So let's, let's, because we have a few minutes left. Let's finish off gushing about how it feels for you to be a published author. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, there are days when it truly is like, oh, I'm an author. Like it, it just, it, it's still, I have been a published author since 2018 but there are days when it still doesn't feel like it. It's so strange. Um, and then like when I go to a book signing, like I did a book signing uh, with, remember we did a book signing a couple of weeks ago here in, um, in Bay City. And it was surreal that people wanted to read my stuff. I would I was such a dork people would buy my book and come up and I'd be like oh my god thank you I'd be <laughs> signing and I'm like bouncing up and down like I'm five years old I was so excited um but it's it's such a it's such a it's such a charge it really is and to know that my characters like Ellie and her band of misfits are out there and people are are following their journey and and becoming them and I just yeah, it's just, it's such a rush. And, you know, I, I also have a WordPress where I talk about, you know, some tips and tricks. And it's also a place for me to kind of vent about those moments where you want to beat your head against the wall because the story won't do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I talk a lot in my WordPress about, you know, if you are a writer, oh my God, just don't be afraid you know, share, share your work. And even if you get one bad review, so what, you know, so it's, what you at least had that fulfillment, right? Exactly. Like I know, like I can relate with that too, since having two collections published, like it feels it's surreal, but it also is wholesome. Like and oh, knowing is. that like p a piece of you is out there. Mm -hmm. for people to absorb an experience. Right. And I think, cause I also have a, a, a collection of poetry as well out there too, called the airless store. And I don't know what I got a bigger charge out of publishing the fantasy novels or publishing that because the fantasy novels, I started those when I was a teenager. Oof, mm. uh, it was a long time for me to publish those. And there's a lot of reasons why, you know, life happens and there's fear and, you know, doubting myself and stuff like that. But when it, came time for the poetry collection. I don't know, hon, how long do you think it took me to publish that? Maybe a couple months. <laughs> it it took, I mean, it long. took you about like a year and a half to write it, I think. Right. But like, I would say it took a couple of months to get that published. Yeah. yeah so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like as astronomically difficult. So I'm just like, I always idolize you and Ari because both of you have this ability to churn out content 
like, well, honey, like you do too. <laughs> well, I, I like I do too, but like for for me, like for me, it's like peppered here and there. For you, for both of you, like you can churn out a sizable amount of content in a reasonable period of time, and I love that about you guys. Oh, that. thank you. Although I do have to own, like I said, that I started the fantasy series when I was 15 and I published it when I was 38. So I don't know how speedy okay, you know, yeah. that is. Speaking of poetry. <laughs> oh, you think of poetry, I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> Although I will say this, like about the mystery novel, I started that in 2020 in quarantine when I had nothing better to do. Um, and here it is two years and a couple of months later and it's almost done which is pretty which is yeah it is impressive considering how much has happened over the past two years too like yeah. there's been a lot going on you know mm -hmm. so all right so some final thoughts as we close out this episode which i love this conversation by the way um <clears throat> so considering we are living in a time where there are attacks on multiple groups of people where there are states where they are banning books and literature and stuff like that. Fiction is more important now than it ever has been mm -hmm. because it allows us to create bridges between one another. It allows us to see ourselves represented in wholesome, positive ways that validates our existence Right. So if there's anything, if there's any reason to lose yourself in some fiction, I would say that that itself yep. is a very good reason. Right. Heather, any final thoughts from you? Words of wisdom? Read more. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Do give yourself excuse to read. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, and, and to be honest, it's like, you know, I, I we have that session on, you know, is print dead? I hope print never dies. I mean, there's, I hope not either. yeah, there's... I know, I know we can read on our cell phones and I, I know, but there's just something about holding a book. Ooh, and it's like, and knowing that we're like <gasps> authors as well, holding our own books. Oh my God. I have another level. I me too. cried when my books came. So me yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Well, my friends, uh, thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. Check the description section of this video for links to Heather's Amazon and WordPress website. So you can oh, go check out you, her Mom. books. Of course. Um, and we love you. And we will see you for the next episode. Talk to you soon.